I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but I have at times wondering why it is that God saves us and then leaves us in this world. What is the real purpose for being a Christian? Surely God could have devised a simpler plan. He could have back in eternity past when he was uh, laying out all the decisions and activities and the different components of the age ages uh, in his plan, he could have easily said on uh, uh, January 1st, the year 34, just a few months after Jesus died, I'm going to save everybody like that and take them all to heaven. Uh, he could have done that, right? I mean, he, God is all-powerful. He's the one uh, that makes all those major decisions. He could have done it that way. But he did it. And that does leave some Christians with a bit of a problem. Especially Christians that don't fully understand or have a good understanding at least of the plan and the program of God and God's purposes for today. In our study this morning in the 21st chapter of Joshua will help you a long way toward understanding why it is you're here today if you're a Christian. This very important truth is illustrated in an Old Testament framework. As we have been working our way through Joshua, we've been observing that what happened to the Jewish nation thousands of years ago had, was specifically chosen by God and recorded in the Bible to illustrate for us continuing principles that apply to our lives today, even in the 20th century. Now, some of you might find that a little difficult to believe, but you cannot read the Bible and miss that point. Romans chapter 15 says that uh, whatever happened before, that is in the Old Testament, was written for our learning and our admonition upon whom the end of the ages are come. So it actually says, God worked it out. He's the one that laid this plan out and he worked it out that the examples and experiences in the Old Testament are in fact a teaching lesson for us who live after Jesus Christ. Now 20 centuries have just about come and gone since Christ, but no major changes have taken place that would indicate that we are in some other realm of God's plan and program. We are in the post-Christ era, the Christian era. But that hasn't changed with the past of 20 centuries. And so these principles still apply to us just like they applied to the early Christians who received the Book of Romans, let's say, way back in the first century. There are other, several other places that we don't have time to look at this morning that indicate that truth, that the Old Testament is there for our learning. So what I would like to do with you this morning is to survey quickly through the 21st chapter of Joshua to observe um, what specific lesson that this chapter has for us. If you have a Bible like mine that has little headings at the chapters, you'll observe this chapter is probably entitled something like the, the Cities of the Levites or the Levites' 48 cities or something to that effect. Now, what in the world do 48 cities have to do with the Christian life? Listen up. Let's read the first two verses, make an observation and then uh, take a quick scan down through the remainder of the chapter. I would say that the important part of this chapter are the first two verses and the last four, the last three. Then came near the heads of the fathers of the Levites unto Eleazar the priest, and unto Joshua the son of Nun, and unto the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spoke unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in with the pasture lands thereof for our cattle. And the children of Israel gave to the Levites out of their inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their pasture lands. And he proceeds to list them city by city down through uh, about verse 40 and 41. We'll pick up there. 
Verse 41, all the cities of the Levites within the possession of the children of Israel were 48 cities with their pasture lands. These cities were every one with their pasture lands round about them. Thus were all these cities. And the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he swore to give to their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt in it. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he swore to their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed nothing of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Before we look into this any further, let's ask the Lord to bless our time this morning. We bow before you, Heavenly Father, this morning, a beautiful day that you've given to us to spend a half an hour or 45 minutes looking into the Bible the book that you have given to us to teach us how to live and the way to go. Father, we pray this morning that you will break down any barriers that we have erected against you. We pray that you would soften our hearts and help us to be open and receptive to this. Help us to acknowledge freely before you that we are needy and that in our own strength we are simply incapable of walking through this life without making mistakes. We need to rely upon you. Father, Open our hearts this morning. Teach us by your spirit. Pray that you convict where necessary. Encourage those who are discouraged this morning. We pray, Father, for those of us who are simply lacking in understanding, that you will teach us and illumine our minds and thereby help us to be all prepared to go out from here this morning, this afternoon, throughout the remainder of this week, to be more effective as examples and witnesses to the onlooking world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last three verses of this 21st chapter are considered by Bible scholars to be the key, bo- key verses to the book of Joshua. It is here that everything has finally come together over a period of five or six years since Joshua led Israel across the borders east of the country into the promised land. And for those of you who are visiting or perhaps uh, are unfamiliar, I need to draw a map again of the land of Palestine because uh, the lessons um, that we are about to look at uh, have a lot to do with this geography. You don't have to be a geography buff, but it helps to explain the story. Uh, If we go back for five minutes and review the three major sections in the book of Joshua, we'll discover that the first five chapters in this book told us the preparations that Joshua made to bring the children of Israel from this point westward across this river called the Jordan River into the land of promise. This was the promised land that God had said to Abraham 400 years before Joshua's time, I will give it to your people for an eternal possession to the descendants of Abraham. And all Jews are descendants of Abraham. They had gone down after Abraham's time under Abraham's grandson Jacob into Egypt, which is down here off the map, and they had spent a long time down there in bondage. And you're all familiar with the story of God delivering the Jews uh, through the ten plagues and the death of the firstborn out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of Pharaoh's power, and he led them to this land. But God didn't lead them the easy short route, which is along the coast, the way of the Philistines. He led them in a very long, it seemed like, senseless path. He he took them straight into the hottest part of the desert down here. This is called the Sinai Peninsula. And for about a year's time, he kept them down there. He he trained them, he organized them, and so forth. And then about at the end of that period, he led them up to the southern border of this land and said, go in and possess it. The people took one look at the land. It took them 40 days to check it out. And after 40 days, the the men came back and said, hey, there's no way we can do this. These people have giants here. They've got fortified cities. We just can't handle it. And because the people doubted God's promise, God judged them and killed that entire first generation of Jews that was delivered from Egypt by making them wander for 40 years in this desert. And they all died with the exception of two people, Joshua and Caleb. So Joshua was picked by God to lead the people in. The first five chapters tell us how they prepared to do that. The next five or six chapters in the book, chapters 6 through 12 of Joshua, tell us how that they conquered the land. 
they destroyed the basic power of the indigenous inhabitants. They, a short central campaign, then a, an extended southern campaign, and then a, a fairly lengthy northern campaign. And by these three major thrusts in the country with the armies of Israel, they broke the backbone of their enemies. We now are working our way almost to the end of the third section in Joshua, which is from chapters 13 to 24 in this book, which tell us how the Jews were instructed by Joshua to go ahead and ferret out the pockets of resistance and to go in and, and to possess that which basically was theirs. There were still enemies in the land, but their major power has, was broken, and it was their duty now to go into their plots of land and beat out the remaining resistance and to settle on it and possess it, take control. In the studies that we have spent on this, uh, in chapter 13, we looked at some basic principles for possessing the land. That the job never is quite finished, and even though my father is uh, getting older, and his father is dead, and, and there have been Christian leaders from the time of Christ for 2,000, uh, 2000 years about, even though all these men have gone on and done their work ahead of us, the job still is unfinished today, just like it was unfinished in, the, in Joshua's time. We, there are certain principles that equally apply to our lives. We need to get on the ball and get at it and do our part, get involved. Chapters 14 to 17 give us some prime examples. Uh, it's not enough to have principles. God wants us to have good examples. And we have the example of Caleb and Othniel and the daughters of Zelophehad. Uh, people that you've probably never heard of in some cases, but they're tremendous examples of winners, people that took God seriously and they actually carved themselves out of place. And they parallel Christians in our day and time and in church history who took God at his word and said, I will get involved, I will commit myself, I will fight the fight of faith. And we have lots of good examples in church history. Chapter 20, which we looked at last week, showed us the protection that God wants us to have while we are busy doing our job. It was necessary for the Jews to have places that they could run to if by accident, let's say, they killed one of their co-workers. And uh, we looked at the six cities of refuge, three on this side of the Jordan, three on this side of the Jordan, that God gave to help his people uh, be free from unnecessary uh, demands of justice in case they kill somebody by accident. Uh, the cities of refuge are a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ. He is our ultimate refuge as believers today. The blood of Jesus Christ continues, John writes, to cleanse us from our sins. Instead of God wiping us out when we lie, cheat, steal, or whatever, as Christians, we can run to Jesus Christ, who is our city of refuge. And the cities of refuge take us back to ground zero, back to basics, and show us that in spite of all our failures in this business of living for Jesus Christ and possessing our land today, we can always go back to Christ and find protection that we need. None of us are perfect. Today we look at the primary influence that God wanted to pervade this land. And as we've read, there were 48 cities that God instructed Joshua to establish throughout the land of Palestine, both on the west side and then the eastern territories, in which the Levites were to live. Now, everybody's familiar with the word Levite, but I'll bet you don't know much about Levi. Who were the Levites? Where did they come from? What was their job? How were they different from Zebulonites and Asherites and Issacharites and Judahites? What was unique about this particular tribe of people? That's what we want to look at this morning because it's a tremendous lesson on why we Christians are left in the world today. God could have, could have brought them across into the promised land and just wiped out all their opposition and made that the eternal kingdom, but he didn't. He made them fight. We have a job to do today. God has left us in the land, and we Christians, I believe, are like the Levites. Let's look at it. We Christians are like the Levites. We, God wants us in the land, and we have a job to do, and we have to take it seriously. If we don't do our job, it's like the cities aren't there. And uh, you're hopefully going to learn something about the great significance of the cities of the Levites this morning. 
we've read the first two verses how that the Levitical leaders of this tribe came to Joshua and the people that were responsible for parceling out, parceling out the, the portions of land and reminded them about the promise that Moses had made when Moses was still alive over here in the plains of Moab about seven or eight years prior to this. Moses had said, and it's recorded in Numbers chapter 35, which we won't take time to read this morning, that when you go into the land, Joshua, you have to set 48 cities aside for the tribe of Levi. That's their inheritance. In verses 3 to 42 in this chapter, which we just finished surveying, we see the receipt of the promised cities. They're listed, and it says they gave them to them. And then the rest followed. These key verses in chapter 21 at the end talk about the rest. Um, the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he had swore to their fathers. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Um, rest is something that every one of us desires. Uh, don't you like to just sit back and take it easy? Not have to worry about anything? Um, I'm going to say this morning that I believe that a person who has trusted Jesus Christ and is living for Jesus Christ as the Lord intends is the only person in this world that really has rest. You may have, you, you may not be a Christian this morning. You may have lots of money and you may have no responsibilities and you may think you have rest but that's nothing compared to what it's like to be a Christian. Knowing where you're going, having your eternal uh, destiny settled, and knowing why you're here, and knowing that you've got the power to live victoriously. There's no comparison between the two. It's very possible for a person to be a Christian, and yet not to have rest. To be very upset, and in a life in turmoil, a life that has lived according to fleshly, worldly principles rather than the principles of God's Word. And uh, as Paul says, if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What we are seeing in the 21st chapter of Joshua is God's provision so that His people would have rest. And the Jews did this, and they did have rest. That's the main point of the chapter. This was the last outstanding thing that Joshua had to do for the Jewish people before the people as a whole could have rest. If they hadn't established these 48 cities, they would not have had rest, I believe. And so it's very significant. I, I was contemplating finishing the book of Joshua this morning. I was going to preach one last message on chapters 23 and 24, but as I started to read through and, and ask myself, why, why did he talk about those 48 cities? And, and then it dawned on me. They are there for a very important reason. They were necessary for the people to have rest. And so there is something here for us to take home and we'll finish it another time. Right? Finish the book at another time. But the 21st chapter here is crucial. It shows us why we are here and what God's primary intention for us is to be. Now let's look at it. Um, Who was Levi? Hold your finger here in Joshua 21. We'll be coming back. And, and go with me to Genesis chapter 29. We're just going to do some little historical background for a few moments. I think it's important to have this in our minds. Because this it's only the historical background that brings out the significance of why Levi and not one of the other tribes. And why, why 11 of the tribes of Israel were given large tracts of land and yet Levi was just given a, a city here and a city there and a city over here and a city up there. There's a vast difference between the type of inheritance that the Levites got as opposed to all the other tribes. Very significant. Genesis chapter 29 and verse 34 tells us where Levi came from. You remember Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob grew up, left home because he deceived his father and ran away from his brother who was threatened to kill him because he deceived him, took away his birthright. He was kind of a deceptive character and he had to spend 20 years away from home. He never saw his mother again and he begot, he married uh, two women during this time that he was gone way up north in Syria and uh, he, he 
begot uh, 11 children while he was up there. He begot one child when he was down here, his last son. And Leah, Levi was his third son. We read that in chapter 29 of Genesis in verse uh, 34. Leah conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time will my husband become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And in the Hebrew, uh, Levi means joined or attached. Uh, Jews, it was the Jewish custom to name their children according to some signification. I named my children. Uh, I gave them the names I did simply because there was a certain special meaning of those names. I liked that name, just not just the sound of it. And that's similar to the Jewish custom. They named their children because of some specific incident. Ichabod, for example. Ichabod uh, means the glory has departed in a, in a That was, that was a name given to one of the, the sons of one of the Le Levites uh, many years later after this time when the enemies of Israel captured the Ark of the Covenant and took it away and, and dispossessed the Jewish people of the very place where God resided. The glory has departed from Israel. And so she, she gave birth right at, at that particular time and named her son according to that very devastating incident. That is an illustration of the significance of Levi's name. He was born into an unhappy home. Um, his father had married two women. Uh, he had intended to only marry one. She was the youngest and the prettiest in the family. And uh, in those days, they covered the bride completely with a veil that you could not see through. And when he woke up in the morning, he discovered that the daughter that he had married was not the pretty young one. It was the older, plain one. He was rather upset. So he married the second one. And this first one um, conceived two or three times, uh, but was very unhappy in her relationship with her husband because she knew that she wasn't loved like her younger sister was, who was the second wife. You can imagine what kind of a situation that was. And Levi was the third son. And Jacob paid for this, by the way. If you read through, and we're going to turn with me to Levitic, uh, I mean Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, we have one of the major incidents in the lives of this family. Jacob had long since returned from Syria. Benjamin, his last son, had been born down in Israel when he had returned returned uh, into fellowship with his father Isaac. Uh, Jacob had settled here. Isaac had died. Jacob's sons had grown up. And they demonstrated in their lives the characteristics of their deceptive father. They had been born out of Israel. They had been raised with non-Jewish, very ungodly attitudes. These, these men were deceivers and rapists. That's what kind of people Jacob begot. And we read the when he was an old man, he was finally restored to his um, son uh, Joseph, who had been dis sold by his own brothers. <laughs> Eleven of these guys got together, and they didn't like Joseph because he had special dreams and said they were all going to bow down to him. And they sold him as a slave one day while they were out in the fields to Egypt. Nice guys, eh? How'd you like to have a brother like that? That's what kind of a family this was. And Levi was in on that. He helped to sell his brother. Okay? So years later, uh, their deception was exposed by the, in the providence of God, and Jacob was brought down to Egypt and restored to his son Joseph. And just before he died, he gathered his 12 sons around him, and he delivered the message of Genesis 49. The, the, the promises and the blessings of the elder in the family to the uh, next generation. I'm not going to read them all. Reuben is found in verse 3. Simeon and Levi are found in verses 5 to 7. That's the ones we are interested in. Judah in verse 8 and the others down through verse 22. What did he say when he was dying to his two sons, Simeon and Levi? He said, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung oxen. That's what my translation says. The King James says they digged down a well. In the Hebrew language, some passages are very difficult to translate. I don't know what that means. 
Verse 7 continues, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. Now this is the significant part. He said to these two sons of his, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now that was some kind of a blessing. All these other guys got, well, not, not all of them, but the majority of the other brothers got something positive said about them. But these two brothers, Simeon and Levi, were both given the same blessing. And basically the father said to these two sons when he was dying, he says, they're going to end up divided and scattered among all their brethren. Why? Why would he do that? He in indicated that it was because they had instruments of cruelty and they had done bad things. What is he alluding to? Well, if in between Genesis 29, where um, Jacob was born, uh, uh, leave, Jacob begot these sons, and 49, in these 20 chapters, we have the story of Jacob coming from Syria to Egypt. When he got halfway between this lake and this lake in the land of Palestine on his way home, before Benjamin was even born, they were stopped in a place called Shechem. And jo uh, Jacob had one daughter by the name of Dinah. She went out walking one day, and one of the local inhabitants found her and committed fornication with her. He was an important man. His father owned the city, Shechem. And uh, when the sons found out about this, they were, they were really angry. And it says that Simeon and Levi, these two sons, went and uh, they eventually killed all the men in the city. Right? They had promised them, they had made a, a kind of like a treaty with these individuals, but these two men had done it deceptively. And they had gone in three days later after they had circumcised all the men, they had promised to make friends with them if they would be circumcised. Circumcision is a very painful process, especially for grown men. They circumcised these people. Three days later they went in while these men couldn't walk, and uh, they killed them all to make up for what this one man did to their sister. And ever since that time, Jacob had had it in his heart that these two sons were going to pay for what they did. Liars and deceivers and murderers is what they were. Real nice moral characters. That's where Levi came from. Now, there's a lot more to the story than this. Um, when Levi went down into Egypt uh, and received this uh, curse from his father, he had three sons. And uh, what we're going to discover is that when the land was por parceled out under Joshua, this was the territory that was given to Judah. We don't have time to read this all, but we run out of time. But Judah was given this one of the largest portions of the land under Joshua. Simeon was not given a specific portion. He was simply divided. He had to share the southern portion of Judah. So this was Simeon. This ended up being Simeon's inheritance. You're going to read it there in, in Joshua chapter 20 or about verses chapters 18, 19, and 20, and you'll read it. This was Simeon's inheritance. He never did have his own. He had to share Judah's. And Levi ended up not getting an inheritance. He was literally scattered. He was literally scattered. Now, to me, um, you're going to say, big deal big deal. You know what this? There is, there has been about 500 years. Um, you know, it would be that, it would be about 350 years perhaps, or 300 years between uh, Jacob's pronouncement of blessings on, or cursings on Simeon and Levi, and 300 years later, the descendants of these two men, they have formed large family groups by now. <laughs> they come into the land and God God worked it out that way. What this teaches me is that uh, things that we might think are rather insignificant are very frequently of great significance in the plan and the program of God. Another illustration, a woman has a baby and she decides not to allow the enemy to kill her baby. She puts him in a basket and puts him in the river. Seemingly insignificant. A woman trying to save her child in a hostile foreign environment. Just a little baby. Just another baby boy. See? It seems so insignificant to us, but God worked it out. This man became the deliverer of, e of Israel and led the people to the promised land. Um, 
it's rather interesting that uh, Jacob, who was a man of faith, I believe, was led to speak these words, and God actually was indicating what he was going to do with these two tribes. So that's the origins of the tribe of Levi. That is why I believe that they were Simeon and Levi were scattered and given very different inheritances than anyone else in the land. What was the purpose of the tribe of Levi? How was Levi unique from all the others? Now this is probably the real meat of uh, the real significance of of what we're looking at this morning. Uh, let's look at a couple of passages that explain um, the duties of the Levites and how their responsibilities were different from the others. In Exodus chapter 28, I just want to read the first two verses. I've got to put it in context. Where is Exodus in this story of, of Israel? You have to understand that this is after, this is during the days of Moses. This is way back a few years. Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he has led them down to Mount Sinai. This is where they camped for about three months down in Mount Sinai. While they, while they were there at Mount Sinai, gave, God gave all kinds of instructions and, and and he organized the people and he gave a lot of laws at Mount Sinai. That's where the Ten Commandments were given, at Mount Sinai. And it was here that God basically organized the tribes and, and parceled out the responsibility. And for the first time, Exodus chapter 28, Aaron, who is a Levite, and Moses himself was of the tribe of Levi, these were the leaders of the people and God was now kind of streaming their responsibilities different ways. Verse 1, Take thou to you, Moses, Aaron your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister me in the priest's office, even Aaron, and then his sons Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory, for beauty, and so forth. This is the first time that there was a distinction made. Um, okay, let's back up. Abraham then Isaac, then Jacob, and then Jacob had 12 sons. These 12 sons basically became the 12 tribes. Their descendants formed tribes in the nation. Now, for the first time, God is portioning out one tribe, and he's saying, Moses, your brother Aaron, who like you is of the tribe of Levi, Aaron's sons now are going to be the priests for the people. The priests. No one else. There are even Levites who wouldn't be priests. Moses wasn't a priest. He was a Levite, but he wasn't a priest. Only through Aaron would there be priests and his sons. And this is the way it remained from then, then on in Jewish history. To elaborate a little bit, uh, let's go to uh, Leviticus chapter 8. While they were still down at Mount Sinai, um, all the sons of Aaron and Aaron himself, who was the high priest, they were consecrated. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and so forth. Gather all the congregation together to the door of the tabernacle. Moses did like the Lord commanded. The assembly was gathered. Verse 5, Moses said to the congregation, This is what the Lord commanded to be done. Verse 6, And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water, put on him the coat, and put all this paraphernalia on. It was an outward, it was like a, a particular uniform that the priestly men were to wear to identify them as useful for a specific function. In our society, we're familiar with the same sort of thing. You can, you can tell a policeman because his uniform identifies him as a policeman, and he's different from a parking attendant, right? And he's different from a fireman. They have similar uniforms with different functions, and the priests had a specific function and a, and a unique, you could tell by looking at them, they were priests. And it was Aaron and his sons that presented themselves, according to God's commandments, to be the priests. Now, we don't have time, we just don't have time this morning, but as you go through the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, before 
which all took place prior to the time of Joshua, where we are picking up with in Joshua chapter 21, there were literally dozens of specific, very significant events that took place that highlighted the importance of the Levites and their unique duties. The Levites, for instance, were um, responsible for atoning for new mothers. Uh, when, a, when a woman gave birth to a child, uh, she was to offer a sacrifice because she was considered to be ritually unclean. So the, the Levites were responsible to care for that. The Levites were to care for people with leprosy and to um, offer sacrifices to cleanse people that had ritual uncleanness uh, for all kinds of sickness. They were responsible to deal with these people. They had to atone on the Day of Atonement one day a year for the whole nation. Um, they were responsible to see that the only sacrifices that were offered amongst the Jewish people were offered at the tabernacle, one and only place. There was only one place in the city in Israel where the Jews were supposed to offer up sacrifices. In the days of Joshua, it was right here in a place called Shiloh. Eventually, that was moved to Jerusalem, all right, in Judah, right? But Shiloh was where the tabernacle was set up, and no place else in the whole country were there to be sacrifices and offerings of worship and atonement done in the nation except right here and the Levites were responsible to see that that was done and they were responsible to see that nowhere else would people fall into idolatrous practices it was common for people to offer up sacrifices wherever they wanted to on top of a hill if this was Palestine 4,000 years ago there'd probably be an altar on top of that hill over there on the other side of the valley because they picked the highest spots in the land to be closest to their God for all to see and that's where they did their sacrificing and the Levites were responsible to see that people didn't do that the Levites were um, uh, restricted to um, only marrying certain kind of women uh, only um, in all the tribe of Levi, only healthy male specimens were allowed to become priests, even if they were descendants of Aaron, if they had, if they were born with, uh, you know, with six fingers on one foot or on one hand, they, uh, you know, which is not, you know, uncommon. I mean, there, are, you know, we are, our bodies have been uh, affected by the curse, and so the people are born with uh, growths and things in their bodies are. You know, if somebody had a, a, a withered leg, you know, or, or had cancer, or, uh, you know, some, a skin disease, they couldn't be priests. Only perfect male specimens could be priests. And, and uh, this was to illustrate the perfections of the priesthood and to illustrate that we as Christians today, who are God's priesthood today, are to be clean and holy before Him, to be good examples to those who, around, who are around us. The priests were to be... Um, um, to have a, a special diet. They could only eat the food that was offered to God. Very interesting. Very interesting. They could only eat food that was offered to God in the tabernacle. They couldn't just eat anybody's food, which is an in indication, you know, what come garbage in, garbage out sort of thing today. We have to be careful what we take in as Christians. If you feed your mind garbage, you're going to live that way. Um, the, the priests were responsible to administrate the worship and the feasts. That there were seven national feasts that were to take place throughout the year, and the priests were responsible to see that that was carried out. They were responsible to, um, um, to administer the taking of vows. They were to um, carry the tabernacle around, to take it down, to put it up. They were to guard the tabernacle. I wanted to draw a diagram of the tabernacle. I keep talking about the tabernacle. But the tabernacle was basically the center of worship for the nation Israel. And, and it, was, it was first constructed while the Jews were down here at this Mount Sinai where God organized the priesthood and gave them the laws and so forth. From that point on in their history for about, you know, three or four hundred years, this tabernacle remained in use in the nation. And God resided right here in the Holy of Holies. And... God wanted this place protected from just anybody walking in and doing whatever they wanted. And so priests, Levites, were, were situated here, here, and here. 
And Levites were also situated here. The three sons of Aaron, I think it was Merari and uh, Gershon and Kohath, the three sons of Aaron who were the priests. No. They were, yeah, they were all Levites, uh, descendants of Levi through Aaron. They, these, uh, these families protected these three sides, and then Moses and Aaron himself protected the front entrance. And uh, that was one of their duties, to keep anyone from profaning the worship of God. All right? It's kind of parallel to the job of spiritual leaders today and Christians, that we are responsible to discipline ourselves and to uh, examine ourselves and to see that the devil doesn't work through us and through other people we know to, to pollute God's worship today. Uh, the priests were responsible for um, um, blowing the trumpets when the nation went into war and at all significant occasions. Um, the priests were not the warriors, by the way. Uh, they didn't even go spy in the land. There were men taken from all the tribes except Levi to spy with the land. And when God took a census of all the tribes in Israel, both at Mount Sinai and here on the plains of Moab, there were two national censuses taken, sensei, <laughs> taken uh, in, in these years during Moses' lifetime. Uh, all the other tribes, um, men were counted if they were 30 years old and upwards, between 30 and 50, they were counted as warriors. But for the tribe of Levi, um, their census was taken at a different time, and Levites were included from the age of one month and up. And uh, it's kind of interesting to compare the numbers. Um, I think at Mount Sinai, the first generation that had come out of Egypt, there were something like um, 22,000 Levites. Um, only of which there were only like 80, about 8,500 men who could have acted as priests. So there were about 8,500 priests in Israel from the time of Sinai to the time of Joshua. In Joshua's time, the second generation was numbered and there were 23,000 Levites. So it, it remained fairly stable. But it just shows you that there were a lot of people there. They needed 48 cities for 23,000 people to live in and their wives and so forth. Now, why am I saying this? Because of the specific duties of all the people in Israel, the priests were the ones that naturally, upon whom naturally the responsibility for the spiritual life of the nation and seeing to it that there was clean worship and people would have the opportunity to worship God and to protect the people from God's wrath for idolatry and so forth, the Levites were responsible for the spiritual life of the people. And the priests were a subsection of the Levites. They were the cream of the crop, these men, the sons of Aaron. Now we come to Joshua, chapter 21. And Moses, before he had died, when, they, when Israel was still camped over here, and we read about it in Numbers 35, Moses had said, God wants you to establish 48 cities for these people when you go into the land. Now in Joshua chapter 21, the time has come for them to implement that. And I, I'm not about to tell you where the 48 cities were, except to say that in the southern portion of the land there were 13, or 13 cities down here. There were um, 10 cities in the central country. There were uh, 12 cities basically on the east side of the Jordan, and there were um, uh, 13 up north. That, it, that adds up to 48. And what this is showing us is that God wanted this all-pervasive, purifying influence of the godly, the most godly people in the nation. He wanted them spread all over the place. He didn't want them concentrated in one little locality. He wanted them everywhere. And that's the point. That's the whole point of 48 cities spread throughout the country. God wanted the Levites, the godly leaders, the teachers, the, the men who led the worship, the ones that would protect people from idolatry. He wanted them spread through the whole country. What's the point for us? Turn with me to...